Uh, so hello everybody. Um, so um, welcome to this uh, first talk on this NGCDI Tech Talk series. So this is a series of presentations um, uh, delivered by researchers working on uh, on the NGCDI project. This is a prosperity partnership between BT um, and four UK universities: uh, University of Bristol, University of Lancaster, University of Cambridge, and University of Surrey. Um, and this is um, a series of more technical talks where we get our um, researchers to present some of the um, uh, practical work that they have been doing during the project. Um, so um, for this first uh, presentation, um, uh, I'm happy to, to present uh, Alex Jung. Alex is a PhD student with Lancaster University. Uh, he's in his third year. Um, and in the last one year, uh, one year and a half, he has been also collaborating closely with NEC. It started um, as, a, as an internship um, and he's currently um, um, helping also with uh, the open sourcing process, process of the project. And he will be presenting some of the work that he has been doing, which is an essential part for a lot of our monitoring uh, and VNF um, uh, building process. So I'll hand over to Alex and thank you very much for taking the, 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 the offer to deliver this talk. No, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'll be giving a talk called Fast Specialized Unikernels the Easy Way. Um, this is a, a bit of a technical dive into what a unikernel is and how Unicraft facilitates unikernels. Uh, this is a large collaboration of a lot of different companies and institutes um, uh, some of you can see below here, um, and this, as Harris said, I'm a PhD student, but also a core maintainer um, of the Unicraft project. Um, and I'll basically get into the premise um, for this talk, and that's basically uh, we want higher cluster utilization uh, with decreased operational expenditure. Um, and kind of what this means is we're using inefficient technologies um, uh, and we're trying to target ways to increase uh, uh, deployments, a uh, number of deployments using existing infrastructure without having to scale sort of uh, vertically or horizontally purchasing more machines. Um, we also try and target sort of uh, services uh, that are running uh, uh, on limited resources, right? So we want to try and better utilize those limited resources. Um, this is actually uh, best uh, uh, illustrated and described in an article uh, by Sarah Wang and Martin Casado. Uh, called the cost of the cloud, a trillion dollar paradox, and it basically goes into details about how uh, you're using the cloud or you know any sort of deployment uh, infrastructure, whether that's public, whether that's private, whether that's the edge. The analogy, the analogy plays the same, um, and that's that um, we're not you know not using them as efficiently. The more that you start to use them, the more inefficient they become. Um, so uh, to try and address this problem. Um, you might think of looking at your whole stack. And so if we think of a typical VNF type uh, deployed service. Um, it's running on top of traditionally a virtual machine of some sort. Um, and that virtual machine is populated with uh, many unused services, many unused libraries, um, and parts of the kernel uh, underneath all of this um, that are being underutilized, not utilized at all. Um, so we have a bit of a bloat problem when you deploy your service. You're running something uh, that's using more uh, resources than it actually requires. Uh, so um, one way is obviously to remove all the services, to remove those libraries. Um, but uh, when you dive even further down the stack and go into the kernel, you find that there, you're trapped in a maze of interdependencies between uh, different uh, sort of core modules. Uh, you can't necessarily disable, for instance, the block device drivers uh, uh, or the mechanisms to read block device drivers uh, within Linux kernel without it being affecting affecting the memory management or scheduler, etc. So you really can't make a minimal kernel, uh, uh, Linux kernel, for example. Um, and we understand this uh, as a result of sort of the organic way that it grew over time. Uh, things were just added and they became more interdependent. Um, so to address this problem, um, we try and think of the stack um, as a series of uh, different components that we can libraryize. And so we look at the full stack of a particular application, uh, for example, some sort of VNF type application that you would deploy in a typical uh, uh, monolithic operating system um, uh, distribution of Linux, for example. Um, we look at all the different components um, that might require an application. We turn them into individual libraries. Um, paired with a build system, and this is what Unicraft uh, is essentially, 
uh, we go through a process of picking and choosing those different uh, uh, libraries as we need them um, and constructing what is known as a, a unikernel. This is a final binary image um, that has only the necessary sort of uh, uh, libraries and uh, platform and hardware code uh, that is needed to make the application run. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Um, so a unikernel is actually a type of compile time specialization strategy where you take your uh, application, your VNF, and you turn it into something bespoke uh, uh, through uh, your compile time. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a great a use case for uh, lightweight VNFs. It um, uh, has a single sealed address space. So the application code, uh, you know, when it uh, manages its memory, it's the same space as the kernel, um, which means that there is no costly syscall. So a syscall is a guard typically between the kernel uh, and user space. Uh, checking, for instance, whether you have the permission to actually uh, read or write a file or open a socket. Um, you no longer have this uh, uh, guard, so uh, the, the, the call itself doesn't spend so many CPU instructions uh, checking whether that's possible or not. To, you are allowed to do this in this space. Um, so it already has the necessary functions to include. It doesn't, for example, I mentioned the block device. If you don't need or don't read from a block device, you don't need to include this code whatsoever. Um, it has, of course, no daemons. Uh, no system libraries, it doesn't have a shell, uh, you can't SSH into it, uh, it does one certain thing, it has nothing running auxiliary, so you use very minimal resources. And it also targets a uh, certain platform and hardware uh, combination, so when you build your unikernel image, uh, turning your VNF into a unikernel, um, you're actually uh, also targeting where it will run eventually, where it will, it will run as a KVM instance, for instance, or a Zen, uh, whether it will run on a specific hardware architecture, such as Intel x86 uh, or, or ARM, for example. Um, and so when we look at the final interdependency uh, um, relationship between application you know, an application that has been compiled as a unikernel, they are much simpler, and they, of course, only include the necessary uh, uh, bits of uh, modules that are required to make this application run. So Nginx, for example, is a particular example um, uh, that could be you know, used as a CDN, uh, won't have any other libraries uh, uh, that are not necessary to it. Um, so um, when we do all of this hard work and, and, and we turn our application into a unikernel, um, we get a significant boost in a number of different categories, including performance. Um, so when we compare a Unicraft unikernel, and this is a, a graph that shows the throughput of Nginx, um, a sort of HTTP uh, web server, um, compared to Docker, which is maybe a typical way to run uh, a service in the cloud or uh, sort of on a server somewhere, we can get as much as 82% increase in performance. This is throughput requests per second. Um, and also compared to uh, running the uh, same Nginx binary in a, a virtual machine, uh, we also get a similar performance increase uh, compared to it. Um, when we look at um, the resulting image as an artifact, uh, we have a much smaller image. Uh, so when you transport your service, imagine you're deploying a service uh, to a, a different uh, instance, for example, um, the bandwidth in the DC will be reduced significantly. See 42 megabytes here uh, with a traditional Docker, the actually the official Docker image for Nginx compared to our uh, Unicraft Nginx instance. And the same goes for memory usage, right? You're not using as much memory uh, as uh, Docker or as a, as a full virtual machine uh, or as other uh, uh, sort of unikernel implementations. Uh, Unicraft seems to be using a lot less. Um, so uh, when you want to bring an application to uh, uh, a unikernel, uh, we might find that the, you have a large configuration space and you want to achieve that same type of performance and you think that it's very difficult to achieve this performance by changing all of the configuration options. Some 2000 plus configuration options are actually available for um, Nginx on Unicraft and you might think, okay, well, I want to achieve the same performance as the one I demonstrated, but I've got my own unique application, my own unique context. Um, how do can we do this? We have sort of systematically uh, shown that we can, uh, uh, you know, we have a tool that can systematically try lots of different permutations. And so what this graph sort of demonstrates is uh, on the x-axis, all the different permutations uh, um, uh, for uh, Nginx and uh, that we're able to achieve and find higher uh, uh, performance uh, optimizations uh, by systematically choosing the right options. 
Um, so here uh, we can see on this graph, uh, if you look at the bottom, it says L across the first half, and then there's no L. This is uh, showing that when you turn off uh, verbose logging, uh, it might seem intuitive, but uh, if these configuration options are there and they're uh, widespread, that uh, we can actually uh, automatically find the ones that are uh, best suited for the application use case. Um, so uh, to sort of combat uh, or to demonstrate uh, how uh, uh, the limited resources uh, can be effectively uh, used with unikernels, we also ran uh, some uh, benchmarks uh, using some uh, uh, Raspberry Pi has limited resources, uh, sort of a demonstrating of a sort of edge deployment use case um, where we compared a very slim version of the Linux kernel and uh, distribution called Alpine Linux, as well as the, the, the default Raspberry and OS. And we showed that uh, we can have much smaller boot times. Um, so because there is no initialization of system services, because there is no need to initialize uh, uh, the kernel and the kernel has to make all these additional checks, uh, a lean image from Unicraft is much smaller in terms of boot time in the order of um, tens of milliseconds compared to seconds. And in some cases, you can even get to a minute on a traditional uh, um, sort of deployment in the cloud or public private instance. Um, so uh, because we have this reduced uh, kernel image, because we don't have uh, background daemons, we don't have additional services and application code that is running, uh, we have a much reduced attack surface as sort of another benefit of deploying your service as a uh, unikernel. Um, you can even uh, exploit address space layout randomization. Say there is an issue that is undete uh, undetected in your application uh, of a memory leak, potentially a pointer that's uh, misplaced or unfreed. Uh, every time you recompile, because of Unikernel is compile time specialization, every time you make an update or you uh, bring uh, the libraries to a newer version, you can rearrange the organization of the Unikernel so that it is no longer being able to be exploited in the same way. Um, it also uses uh, uh, the lowest level of virtualization, um, that is hardware virtualization. So if you deploy your unikernel as a uh, virtual machine, it's being segmented physically by the resources on the instance. Um, and there's additional ongoing research to create uh, in VM memory protection using hardware acceleration, such as Intel MPK. So this is the case uh, where you might not necessarily trust the networking stack uh, of the unikernel for uh, you're receiving sort of traffic and you don't want that traffic to, for instance, exploit uh, pot potential other libraries that you're on, that are known with inside the unikernel, such as the scheduler, um, such as uh, um, uh, device drivers or, or, or anything else. Uh, the libc, for example, you, you can protect this as well uh, using memory protection rings provided by the uh, hardware. So I'm going to dive into a use case now um, for uh, using unikernels. This is a use case done with Orange Telecom. And uh, they're using uh, unikernels to try and address the problem of uh, uh, longevity of a running instance. So um, when you deploy a service, typically, um, you typically deploy it for an amount of time and you expect that service will receive or not receive traffic. So uh, when you deploy it initially, it won't necessarily receive traffic. It then might receive a request to process a packet, for example, and then it becomes idle again, where it's not doing anything. And this process sort of continues. Um, and so um, to try and address this problem of unused time, the time that is used, uh, uh, is spent idle, is obviously electricity that is being used, uh, uh, going to waste, it is the cost of running that physical machine. It is also the cost of uh, not having other service utilize the machine at the same time. Right? You want to obviously optimize uh, and better use the resources available, especially, for example, uh, in resource constricted environments such as edge deployments. And so to address this, um, one way to approach it is to have a on-demand uh, unikernel VNF processing. So um, what we've done is we've introduced a uh, sort of uh, packet sniffer uh, uh, on the host. Uh, the host is able to uh, uh, facilitate the runtime of virtual machines by KVM. And we sniff the packet and we determine which VNF instance it is meant to go to. Um, whether the instance is online, if it is, it's redirected there. If it is not online, if it has been paused, um, then it is resumed. The fast boot times enables the processing of the packet and the instantiation of the unikernel in a time that uh, amounts to it being uh, quite responsive. 
Um, as a result, we're able to uh, uh, saturate physical machines with thousands of uh, virtual machine instances uh, based on Unicraft uh, that have a VNF uh, uh, sort of embedded into it. Um, and so this, I think, covers the majority of uh, uh, the presentation, uh, sort of a demonstration of what Unicraft is. Um, Unicraft uh, is an open source project. You can find it at this uh, URL on this website. You can get in contact, of course. Um, Unicraft serves as a great way to facilitate the runtime of uh, virtual network functions. Um, it has uh, uh, many supported uh, applications uh, that are tailored for uh, network processing. So not just Nginx is the example that I gave before, but we can, you can run Click. Click is a, a packet processing language, uh, has native support for DPDK, for fast processing of um, um, uh, packets from uh, the kernel. Um, and yeah, I think this sort of concludes the majority of the presentation. Um, do you have any questions?